Good afternoon and welcome to the next uh, symposium uh, in which we, uh, in the name of equity, uh, are going to address and discuss this growing uh, gap in TB burden, the gender gap. And guess what? It's, uh, the problem is mainly among men. Now, I'm, I'm invited to chair this session, but I haven't really done much research in this space. So I wonder why I'm here. It may be because I'm working for the Global TB Program, WHO, and, and some people have, have criticized us of only talking about the TB problem in women and children and forgetting about the uh, uh, agenda for, for what turns out to be the vulnerable sex, in this case, namely men. It may also be that I'm a, this token person from, from the <laughs> vulnerable community. You know, nothing about us without us. So here I am representing this vulnerable group. Um, with this, I'll hand over to my co-chair, Liz Corbett. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunnar. Um, uh, so, so we have got, I, I hope, a very interesting session. This is a topic I think that will be, you know, it's on the up and up. Um, we're hearing very much similar stories, both from TB and HIV, um, uh, and for, uh, uh, so for an infectious condition, um, obviously, even if you're only worried about women and children, you have to be concerned if, if um, transmission is coming mainly from men. Um, just to quickly uh, mention that our first speaker, um, who is a, uh, was giving his patient's perspective, Timur, has been held up. He's here at the conference, but he's been held up um, uh, being much in demand um, in another session. And so uh, we'll start um, with our, our second speaker. And as she's my um, PhD student, Knut's going to introduce her. <laughs> and just quickly saying we've got one emphasis on quantitative. So this is, this is mathematical quantitative. Um, and it's followed by um, a, a focus on qualitative and then um, a program experience of implementation from, from Nigeria before um, wrapping up with advocacy and, an, and a gender tool from Colleen. So then formally, I have the pleasure to, to invite uh, uh, Dr. Catherine Horton, who is a PhD student at the London School of Hygiene of uh, Tropical Medicine in London. Please. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you. Oh, I need to get my presentation. OK, there we go. Um, right, so thank you to all of you for being here and for your interest in this topic. Um, as I begin, it is quite disappointing that Timur is not able to be here. Um, we were hoping that he would be able to discuss his experience and the challenges that he faced when he uh, contracted HIV and when he was trying to access care and go through treatment. Um, and it's disappointing because his perspective as a man is often missing from discussions of gender and TB. It only takes a glance at gender-related documents to recognize that he and other men like Cedric and Ambita, who spoke in the inaugural session, are missing from gender-related priorities. Although men may be mentioned, the greater focus is generally paid on women, and they're the ones about whom detailed information is provided. And this disproportionate focus translates into an assumption that the disease has a disproportionate effect on women. And so priorities focus on improving research among women and increasing case detection and monitoring, again, only among women. But I'd like to ask today that you remember that by definition, gender includes both women and men. And I know that's obvious, but there's a lot of resistance to including men in discussions of gender and TB. Oh, sorry. Um, so today we're going to confront that. We're going to be discussing the epidemiological evidence of gender differences in TB burden and care pathways. I'll focus on pulmonary TB in adults since gender differences emerge after adolescence. And today I'll briefly discuss transmission, disease, access to care, and outcomes. Starting with transmission, I'd like to refer to results from modeling work by Pete Dodd. Using data from the ZAMSTAR study, he was able to estimate the annual risk of infection for men and women in South Africa and Zambia. You can see in this figure that gender differences in the risk of infection emerge after adolescence when the risk of infection becomes higher for men on your right than women on your left. This work also disaggregated the risk of infection by the gender of the source of infection. 
And what you can see is that across both countries, most new infections are likely attributable to contact with men. And so therefore, TB among men is not only an issue for men's health, but it's a significant issue for broader TB prevention efforts. This year, the Global TB Report, for the first time, estimated TB incidence by gender. Across regions, these, uh, these estimates show an excess of new TB cases among men, who comprise at least 62% of new cases globally. Yet incidence isn't the only place that we see gender disparity. These new cases are added to prevalent pools of disease where gender disparity also exists. Earlier this year, we published a systematic review and meta-analysis of prevalence surveys conducted in low and middle income countries between January 1993 and March of this year. In our analysis, we found strong evidence that the prevalence of disease is higher among men than women. Our summary estimates showed that there were 2.2 male cases of bacteriologically positive TB for every female case, and there were 2.5 male cases for every female case of smear positive disease. These results showing an excess of male cases in prevalence were consistent across regions, except in the Americas, where our analysis included only two small surveys among tribal populations. You'll note that the, the greatest gender disparities were found in Southeast Asia, but what I would also like to highlight here are our results from the African region. It's often thought that the prevalence of HIV has reduced or reversed any gender disparity in TB, but what we see here is that that's not the case, and cases among men still outnumber cases among women. We compared our regional results with an earlier analysis, analysis by Martin Borgdorf that included prevalence surveys conducted between 1953 and 1997. While the male to female ratios reported by the two studies were similar in Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific, it's notable that substantial gender disparity appears to have emerged in the African region. These findings are most likely attributable to, gendered, to the gendered impact of the HIV pandemic. Although women have a slightly higher pre prevalence of HIV than men, Recent meta-analyses by Eric Droitz in 2013 and Andrew Ald in 2014 have shown that women are much more likely than men to access antiretroviral treatment. And Andrew Ald's work suggests that this gender disparity is increasing over time. And so men's risk of TB is further increased by missed opportunities for TB, for TB screening as part of HIV care, but also by untreated and undiagnosed HIV. However, HIV is only one of many factors that influence men and women differently in terms of TB burden. Gender differences are likely in biological factors such as susceptibility and immune response. Comorbidities and access to care for those conditions can vary by gender, as we've seen with HIV. Sociocultural behaviors that influence the types, the locations, and the frequencies of social interactions are an important factor as are occupational exposures, particularly in mining or industry. And there's some evidence that household exposure to indoor smoke pollution may also be a factor. There are suggestions that nutritional and metabolic differences between men and women may play a role. And behaviors such as alcohol consumption and tobacco usage are certainly important. Another consideration is timely access to TB diagnosis and treatment. And there are likely many other gendered factors that we've yet to recognize. I'd like to expand on this issue of access to care because timely access to diagnosis and treatment is essential for individual patient outcomes and also for broader TB prevention efforts. Case notification rates have been higher among men than women in the vast majority of countries for as long as these data have been reported by the WHO. Here I've shown data from, the 20, from 2015 when the global male to female ratio in case notifications was 1.7 to 1. Now it's often been suggested that case notifications are higher in women than men because women face certain barriers in accessing TB treatment and diagnosis, and therefore they're missing from these data. However, this assumption would require that the underlying burden of disease show relatively fewer cases among men, and we've already seen strong evidence from prevalence surveys that this is not the case in most settings. 
We investigated this issue further in our systematic review by matching prevalence surveys to national notification data using the same country in the same year. This allowed us to calculate a, a prevalence to notification ratio, which is the inverse of the patient diagnostic rate for each gender. We found that among men, for each notified case of TB, there were 2.6 undiagnosed cases in the community. Whereas for women, there were 1.6 undiagnosed cases for each diagnosed case of TB. Oh, sorry. Our meta-analysis then showed that prevalence to notification ratios, which are an indicator of, of a gap in detection and reporting, are 1.5 times higher among men than women, which indicate that contrary to, to popular assumptions, it is men rather than women who often face greater barriers in accessing timely care. Now another measure of timely access to treatment comes from studies of self-reported diagnostic and treatment delays. As a systematic review by Susan Vandenhoff in 2010 reports, men often delay seeking care longer than women, yet women may face greater barriers in receiving appropriate medical attention. However, it's less clear how these delays and in individual steps within the care pathway affect the total time that men and women each spend trying to access treatment. And so I'd like to share some preliminary results from modeling work we've done to explore this issue in two settings. We looked first at Vietnam, where the male to female ratio in TB prevalence is very high. And we also looked at Malawi, where the gender disparity and disease burden is less extreme. Using a simple model of incidence, prevalence, and case notifications for each country, we employed a Bayesian approach to explore how prior beliefs about the time from symptom onset to treatment initiation should be modified in light of recent prevalence and notification data. We examined two sets of prior beliefs. First, using self-reported data from smear-positive TB patients who were reporting their time from symptom onset to treatment initiation. These data were similar for men and women, perhaps slightly longer for women in both settings. We then used prevalence to notification ratios, which are equivalent to disease duration when the model is at equilibrium, as it is here. These estimates are much longer and show more substantial gender differences. Our preliminary results suggest that self-reports shown in the dashed lines in the top two graphs substantially underestimate disease duration in both Vietnam and Malawi, much more so for men than for women. Prevalence to notification ratios shown below provide a much more appropriate estimation of disease duration in this model. But what's notable here is that regardless of which prior beliefs are held, posterior estimates are comparable showing that men and women both experience long periods of undiagnosed disease, but that on average, diagnosis for men comes about a year later than it does for women in these settings. Of those who are able to access TB care, gender disparities are also apparent in disease outcomes. And here I focus solely on epidemiological measures of outcomes. Women are more likely than men to adhere to treatment and they have better treatment outcomes. Yet TB remains a leading cause of mortality for both genders, both men and women. In 2015, there were over a million TB deaths among men, and there were nearly half a million women who died from the disease. The gender disparities in TB transmission, disease, access to care, and outcomes are not insignificant. There's strong evidence that the prevalence of disease is higher among men, that often men face greater barriers in accessing care, and that among those who do access care, treatment outcomes are worse among men. And so men are an underserved, high-risk group that can no longer be ignored. The Global Fund has said that gender equity means fairness of treatment for women and men according to their respective needs. The evidence shows that men's needs are great and they are not being met. And so gender equity in TB will not be achieved until this is recognized in gender-related priorities and strategies are adopted to improve men's access to diagnostic and treatment services. In closing, I have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation, but I would like to acknowledge collaborators and co-authors on this work, especially Peter McPherson, Ryan Hubin, Richard White, and Liz Corbett. Thank you all for your 
time and attention. So um, uh, we can have um, one or two, or maybe even three questions if, uh, if you, and I, we'll have a, uh, quite some time for discussion hopefully at the end. Mm -hmm. So maybe we restrict, uh, restrict the questions for clarifications at this point. Hi, uh, I would like to know what are the specific barriers that you think the men have uh, if you can just discuss more that, and also if that they are different than the one than women. I may actually not answer your question right now because our next speaker has done a lot of qualitative research around men's barriers to accessing care, and so I actually, if you don't mind, might wait and let him speak, and then later on we could expand on it if if your questions aren't answered. Oh, one more question. Okay. Catherine, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Lucky from Malawi. Just got a quick question. Uh, yesterday in one of the sessions that I attended, it actually showed that there is, uh, when it comes to TB, um, they, the women actually are lagging than men. And in your uh, presentation today, I think you mentioning that the uh, disparity is mainly for men. Um, so I just need a bit of clarification on that. I think I'm kind of a bit confused. Sure, sorry, could you, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you mention yeah, again so what the presentation is? In, in, in the sessions, had? yes, there were some two, uh, some two uh, presentations that shows that when it comes to TB, uh, in HIV settings it's fine uh, because uh, women obviously have got access to antenatal care and so uh, the um, health system is okay for, for women uh, compared to men. Uh, but when it comes to TB, actually it's uh, the women that are lagging behind in terms of seeking care compared to men. So I think we hear this perspective a lot. It's generally thought that of, in conversations of gender, it's women who face greater barriers, and, and we've heard a lot of evidence suggesting this. Um, I, don't, I think different settings are different, but I think across the board, we're seeing more and more evidence that men are actually the ones being left behind. Um, with all the prevalence survey, surveys coming out showing greater barriers to care, with prevalence to notifications. Certainly women do face great barriers as well, um, but I think we're seeing across regions that, that often it's men left behind. I don't know, I wasn't there for the, for the specific presentations yesterday, so I, I don't know exactly what the evidence was that they were presenting. Lovely. Can, can we move on to our next speaker then? Um, and as uh, yes, as, as uh, Catherine said, uh, I hope some of your answers may be answered, maybe addressed by Jeremiah um, Chikavora, who is a postdoctoral um, social scientist working with HSRC in South Africa, um, and um, a, a Wellcome Trust um, fellow for this particular piece of work. Okay. Uh Good afternoon, and thank you, uh, Liz and Nat. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about the influence of masculinity on care seeking for tuberculosis, and I'm going to present to you qualitative um, findings from Malawi. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we are getting uh, more and more robust uh, evidence that men experience higher and earlier mortality than women as Catherine just presented. Um, and the latest round of reporting by the WHO shows that uh, men contributed 5.9 million of the 10.4 million incident TB cases in 2015. And this is compared to the 3.5 million for women. <clears throat> as Catherine also said, male gender is a risk factor for late diagnosis for tuberculosis and treatment, and also for death while on treatment for both tuberculosis and HIV. Now there is uh, different uh, potential pathways that could explain the scenario, the epidemiological scenario that prevails. Some of them could be biological, social, uh, structural. Um, however, we, we know 
increasingly well that uh, men have poor conduct with primary health care services, and we know that from antenatal care data as well. But we also know that they delay seeking health care. Um, and a review that was done by Van Horn uh, recently shows that men delay seeking health care, but women face greater diagnostic barriers, and that could be attributed to women having more contact with health services and reaching providers more, but providers health, uh, reaching health providers who are less qualified. It may also have to do with the manifestation of symptoms that differs uh, between men and women, so that perhaps women, uh, the uh, algorithms that are available are able to detect uh, TB beta in women. Also to further complicate the scenario, this gender scenario is um, the conversations that have been happening that medicine has evolved around the male body. So perhaps we see differences based on how um, medicine treats the two sexes differently. Okay, sorry about that. Now, uh, we, our study aimed to understand the reasons for the high levels of undiagnosed TB among men in the community, and this study was done in Malawi, and we intended to use the information generated to start thinking about what possible interventions can be done to address this issue and to facilitate men to engage with healthcare. We use social constructionism, uh, which is a body of theory that um, applies historical and cultural lens to analysis. So it sees the world as constructed through uh, daily interactions, and it acknowledges that there are possibilities for multiple creations of the world with meanings, knowledge, power, being plural, but also being uh, contradictory. So as used by Cornell in gender relational theory, uh, Social constructionism will hold that uh, masculinity is also multidimensional, that it operates in a complex network of institutions. It also involves the interaction of men and women at very local levels, but at broader social levels, at broader national structural levels. So various levels determine how gender is created and how it manifests. So it's interwoven with historical factors and also um, structural dynamics. Just to give you a bit of context about Malawi, it is one of the poorest countries globally. It ranks 173 out of 188 on the Human Development Index. It has a high burden of both tuberculosis and HIV, and 71% of TB patients in Blantyre, which is uh, the city in which we did this study, were uh, also HIV positive. The case detection rate is about 43% as in 2015. Malawi is um, also fairly strong in terms of uh, its public health um, um, standing. It is a well-organized but basic health services that are free at point of care, and it is committed to the principle of public health approach. So 61% of all people uh, living with HIV are on medication, on ARVs. <clears throat> so in order to understand this uh, problem, which we didn't quite understand. We only knew that men delay seeking care. We decided to um, sample different people, different categories of participants. We included chronic coughers um, who had not sought care. We also inc included tuberculosis who had just been diagnosed, and community members and the health care workers as well. And we used different methods. We used individual interviews. Uh, and we also used focus group discussions. And at the end of the data collection, we uh, conducted a workshop, a three-day workshop, with various stakeholders to reflect on the findings and help us think in terms of what, of what they mean and how they can help take uh, the agenda forward. So we included both men and women in all the categories, because as Catherine said, men and women co-construct each other. And to understand gender, we have to include both groups. The first theme that I'm going to mention that emerged was theme of control, which emerged as a key 
representation of manhood. So the image of a man in control uh, was represented as a man who is a competent provider, one who is managing his own affairs alone, independently, one who is able to control and oversee his wife's sexuality and movements, but basically one who can uh, have um, oversight over the domestic space. But in this context where there was prevalent um, poverty or limited resources, uh, this was one of the threats to men's ability to be in control as expected or preferred. Also, the expectations from extended family being burdensome in terms of providing support, illness, um, unemployment, and also women needing to go out of the domestic space in order to uh, help generate resources. And in some cases, uh, engaging in extramarital uh, sex. So from masculinity literature, we are aware that when men's masculinity is threatened, they respond in very specific ways. And one of them would be to publicly display strong uh, strength even during illness, or to re-emphasize the strength of the male body including seeking care when very ill, or just embarking on demonstrating that one can be self-reliant, intensively focusing on work and generally relegating um, health. The second theme that emerged was um, the theme of the provider. I mentioned it in passing, but I'm gonna focus on it slightly more. Now, men were expected to be material providers to their families but also in this context where collectivism is valued, where people value sharing, it was also important that you are able to attend to other people's needs that are close to you. Now in the end, uh, in, this also threatened men's ability to achieve this. You are responsible for many people, the conditions of poverty, the pressure arising from family expectations, but also that uh, just the economic uncertainty means that in order for you to be safe in the future, you ought to share with others in the present. So there was a lot of pressure on the men. And how do they deal with this? In order to be able to provide, they were not expected to consider their health issues ahead um, of providing. You, you, it was said you cannot afford to acknowledge a headache and lie down Otherwise, what would your family eat? They must do any type of work in order to raise income. And men opt to continue working even while sick. And the job insecurity, if you don't go to um, work, then your job is insecure and you can be offloaded. Uh, and so in addition, they also will not have time or resources to seek care. So you end up prioritizing um, feeding the family, buying food, rather than um, <clears throat> seeking care. The next few slides are going to show you some of the voices from the participants that indicate some of the issues I've mentioned. Uh, the first one is showing the significance of uh, uh, being a material provider, but also the challenges that men face. So it was said most men don't measure up because employment is scarce. Uh, they, a lot of people are suffering, uh, men don't have ways to get uh, money. But what challenges did they also face from the community, from the other people, from other men? They are in big trouble if they don't provide adequately or they fail as providers. They are humiliated, taken for being useless. You lead an isolated life. Also, a marriage breaks down. There's no respect to you from your children. <clears throat> uh, this slide uh, is speaking to how um, illness in this context led to functional impairment and how one ends up being unable to demonstrate that they can be independent and you are now expecting other people to do things for you like bathing, eating, and yet you're a grown up. So just how much a threat illness is to masculinity. And if you're a head of family, it's like this man was saying it's been complicated uh, ever since he had been ill. The way this family was eating had changed compared to in the past. The way of getting money had changed. And you can see the frustration that he's expressing in the quotation. And he says, it's not the way we eat, no. I don't eat the way I used to. And what this 
also means is that men become afraid of going for health care where they may be confirmed to be having TB or HIV. So the first person, uh, the first participant said there wasn't time, and then it moved on quickly to then say, oh, I didn't have the courage also. So you can see the, even how they explain themselves. Um, and it's like you don't get to be that free to be tested. This was from a participant who had been recommended to have an HIV test after uh, being found to have TB, and he has still not had that test. And so he's explaining that he is looking at the way he was before and how his health has deteriorated, has gone down, deteriorated, and he's saying just because of that TB issue, he's afraid to go for HIV. Uh, this slide is indicating some of the interaction that happens between patients and the health system. So um, it, it, it's saying here yeah, that when you go to the uh, for care, uh, once you're admitted, before they release you, you're told to have your blood tested. You can't run away. Uh, it's just showing you the lack of communication between patients and the health system and how they expect certain things to be done in certain ways but where, for instance, TB integration is being carried out and algorithms that are applied in that, um, yeah, are, are being carried out, then people don't seem to understand them. And she's saying you can't even say you just came to receive the drug for coffee and nothing more. You can't be redeemed. This means they will definitely test your blood and see how you are. Again, you see the fear. But uh, one theme that emerged uh, was that after all this, the fear that punctuates the period before, sorry, the, the time before seeking health care, the time before diagnosis, there was a change, um, <clears throat> there was a shift towards accepting the diagnosis, accepting the treatment. And these two men are saying that, uh, one is saying it's a big thing, I now refrain from worldly things that I was doing, I can't drink beer, I don't smoke, I used to drink really bad, but they said I should ref refrain. I had wanted to stop, but had no specific reason. Now they told me I should take care of my family. I'm very happy. And this one, the second one is also indicating how he is, um, he has sort of reordered the way that he relates even to his wife. And he's saying uh, when he got his medication and instructions on the way home, the wife said, this is your chance, now you can be chast. Uh, and he continued that whatever she tells me, for instance, that you will not leave this house you should first go and have a bath, I obey. So these are some of the changes that uh, happen. I'll just quickly um, go through this slide. What I wanted to show you through these pictures are the impressions that we get when the word masculinity is mentioned. We see people that are violent, people that are irresponsible, that are hypersexual, and yeah, and uh, the slide on the lower left was taken from a health facility in a public display area, and it's showing a woman being beaten in all slides, almost all of them, a woman being manhandled by the men. So these are the, some of the things that, the, the impressions that we get uh, when masculinity is mentioned. But uh, through those narratives, we miss um, <clears throat> how men experience vulnerabilities in their private lives as the data I've just shown. And I think this is what is very important. So uh, when we had collected the data and when we did the workshop, um, a, a, a sort of model emerged that uh, gave direction in terms of how we can move on. So this model had three components. For instance, um, the first one was that uh, it was important uh, to improve men's capacity to access formal health care, including by training health staff to become more aware and receptive of men's needs, dedicating special days for men, setting up mobile vans, and also uh, dedicating special times and algorithms for men at primary care facilities. Uh, also uh, working through um, workplaces in order to reach men so that their time for pursuing uh, health can be freed the second component of this uh, strategy was that we need to pursue awareness of TB and advocate for men's wellness, uh, for instance, through community sensitization, but also consider uh, introducing a men's wellness day, uh, holding seminars, participatory workshops, 
in uh, throughout communities. And the third component was that they should uh, be strengthened interface between communities and healthcare providers. There seems to be a gap where healthcare workers do not seem to explain quite clearly what, why they do what they do. Uh, and this was demonstrated by the woman who said, once you present, you are not sure what's going to happen to you. So there seems to be a gap, and it's, it seems critical that that gap needs to be, to be addressed. So in terms of uh, the way forward, I think what this data is saying is that there is need for complex interventions that have synergistic uh, pathways and the way we can expect multiple uh, domains of effect to emerge. And, and so basically moving beyond uh, simplified um, interventions but considering complex interventions and also continue to understand and address men's vulnerability and its manifestation and how it links to health in different contexts. Um, the way the, the manifestations of gender differ in different contexts, so we need to continue to do research uh, at local level to understand all this in order to be able to address these issues in the different spaces. Also, we need to think about reviewing health delivery strategies with a focus on communication styles, how health delivery is laid out and operating times in order to cater for men, but also think about finding men where they are, including by focusing on workplaces as well, and tailoring counseling so that it's, we are able to capture and retain clients at all stages. And so instead of simply prioritizing those that we think deserve to be attended to, once people present, we need to attend to them so that we retain them throughout. Because from the data, we can see that Sometimes men present when, that, when they are not um, very, uh, yeah, when they are not even very sure that they want to proceed to the next phase. So once you close them out, they go and they go away for good. So we need to be able to try to retain those who present in the first place. In closing, I'd like to uh, thank the funder, the Welcome Trust, and my collaborators, uh, Liz and um, Graham Hart and Nicola Desmond, and the participants uh, in the study, and everyone who supported it. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jeremiah. Uh, excellent, fascinating stuff uh, from you. I think it's really, it, it's nice to see the power of qualitative data uh, that you have so clearly displayed. We can have one or two questions, but while waiting for people to maybe step up to the mic, I, I'll, I'll start with one question myself. Uh, I followed a bit the qualitative uh, literature at the time where there was a strong paradigm around the, um, uh, an assumption that the male-female ratio being high was the access barriers that we heard about in the, in the first presentation. Uh, and the qualitative research was you know, very clearly showing a number of access barriers related to stigma, high risk for women. Um, for maybe higher than for men, about risk of being ostracized, about a lack of empowerment and lack of financial resources. And, and I guess, I mean, I guess you have reviewed that literature as well. And, I, and, and your presentation uh, is focusing on the barriers for men. So the, the results you get is uh, uh, related to the way you phrase your question. So maybe just a comment or, or, or reflection from you on whether you, you are concluding that the barriers are worse for men, or if they're different than those that women are facing? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nat. Um, I'll, in answering your question, I'll just refer to my personal experience um, before I left Zimbabwe. I took my uh, son, he's now in university, to um, a primary health uh, care facility. And my wife, who was always taking uh, my son to, the, to, um, to this specific um, clinic was not available on that day. And the nurses were like shouting, they literally shouted at me like, what are you doing here? Um, where is the mother? We want to see the mother of the children, not you. Uh, of course, I, she was saying it in a sort of jocular manner, but you can imagine there were women in this waiting room and I responded in a jocular way as well. And we got to know each other. But I think what we are seeing, and you put it very well, um, 
what is coming from the data, these different sort of uh, different ways of looking at the vulnerabilities actually show the way that we live and they show how much gender is constructed in a very complex way. And so just to put it in a very maybe simple way, uh, men and women experience different vulnerabilities. And I think that's the message that I'm trying to put across. But what happens is if you focus on one dimension, you focus on men, what is happening epidemiologically at the community level where the men are staying undiagnosed or where the men are defaulting? They are infecting not only other men, but the women that we are working on. So I think this what this conversation should drive us to is we are missing an important segment that we need to understand more. But certainly they uh, face different barriers. Some of them are the same, but some are different. And we need to understand those differences and those similarities. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, please. Hi there, uh, Catherine Snow from Australia. Several of the men you interviewed were talking a bit about you know, economic insecurities and fear of unemployment and you know, a lot of stress around work. Um, and one of the things you suggested was providing health services through work to men. And I'm just wondering whether in the interviews that's something that the men expressed a desire for or whether perhaps there are some risks there in terms of providing healthcare to men through their employers and then perhaps that threatening their employment if it's clear that they're unwell. So what, what did the men kind of feel about that? What did they have to say about it? Okay. Take it. Okay. Thank you so much for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, I think one of the things, um, maybe to just say Malawi is, is very high rates of informal employment almost very, very high, almost near universal unemployment. Uh, I think what I was thinking about was a lot of the men say they don't have time. And I didn't show this slide, but um, there was one taxi driver who was actually dismissed after missing uh, work. Uh, and, and, and only when his employer realized that after dismissing him, about three weeks later, the guy had really was now really, really sick, and I think it's because he didn't have income uh, anymore. Then he came and apologized to him. But you can see just how much the informal sector, but not just the informal sector, where there is high unemployment, people's um, jobs are not safe. I mean, you can pick the next person. So uh, people will try to hold on to their jobs and work, not but also to continue to be able to raise income and work as much as possible in order to uh, retain those insecure jobs. And I think you, you, it, what you say is really valid. There are issues. Um, it is an area that really needs to be um, looked at more closely. I know there are workplace programs that are happening, and of course, I mean, issues of stigma do come up. But I think what this is saying is that we do have men that are failing to access care because they are not able to leave work or the employers are not able to facilitate that, that process. But I think what, what, what would also fit well is to bring the masculinity then, masculinity thinking into the workplace and understand how does it affect both the employer as well as the employees. How are they shaped and how does care seeking then happen with that, within that context? So I think much is work is happening, we have wellness programs at work, there is quite a lot that needs to be done in order to improve the workplace as a site of promotion for men's health. We've, uh, we've actually used up all our spare time from one, last, one missed speaker, so we better move on. To, but thank you very much, Sharon. That's, that's great. <laughs> So we now have um, Ankem Chukweme from um, from the Nigeria KNCV um, telling us about um, their approaches to providing um, uh, access to diagnosis in Nigeria. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me use this opportunity to thank the organizers of the symposium for inviting me to share my experiences um, from the programmatic angle. 
Um, let me also warn that uh, my presentation, there is only one woman in my slide. And every other picture you see are men. So today I'm supporting the men. And, and in preparation for that, I'm going to wear one of the IEC materials for the men. Just to tell you, we are in, um, in tune with you. So give me a second. So this is my background uh, outline, which would include the background objectives and the methods we applied, as well as the strategies. We'll take a look at some of the preliminary results that have come out, and then challenges which we faced, and in conclusion, what we recommend. But first of all, some common phrases which you come across every day in the health sector, in the development banks, whatever field we look at. One of them is this. Global leaders must intensify their efforts to improve women's and children's health. Investing in the health of women and children makes good sense. What doesn't make sense? Investing in men? That's the question we should ask ourselves today. Empowerment of girls and children and resisting gender-related barriers to care. Still girls and children, no men there. But then at whose detriment? Well, this is, there is absolutely nothing wrong in focusing on women and children. But then we have to think of the men. And some background on Nigeria, since our experiences will fall upon the largest African country. Um, Nigeria has an estimated population of 182 million persons, projected from the 2006 census. And based on the TB prevalence that was conducted in 2012, there is an estimated TB incidence of uh, 322 among men and 198 among women. Please take a close look at these figures. We will keep reiterating the importance to focus on men. Looking at the SMEP positive per 100,000 population, we have 484 for men and 198 for women. Prevalence of bacteriologically positive cases, 751 for men, 359 for women. The prevalence rate to the notification rate ratio, gives 7.25 for men and 4.63 for men. Coming down to Lagos, which is our setting, which we did this, um, we carried out these strategies. As at the end of 2015, there was a total of about 5,169 TB cases in Lagos, found among men and 3,601. Looking at all of this with some peculiar focus, you'd see that Though there are stories, there are strategies, there is a cry out outside that we should focus on women and children. The men actually are the vulnerable group that need the attention. Just a little peek on what Lagos looks like. It's a metropolitan city. Going by the 2006 census, it gives a projected population of 10 million, but Lagos decided we want to do our own census, and then they came up with a figure of 22 million. Whichever way, the proportion, contribution to the total country's population is about 5 to 12 percent. This is Lagos. So if you plan to come to Lagos, be prepared to think about what strategy would you use to move around in Lagos. Lagos is a congested city, is a megalopolis city, it's majorly urban, and we know from all the experiences that have been shared during this conference, TB is found mostly in the urban setting. So how do we manage through the traffic? We go through what we use, what we call Okadas. So Okadas are actually motorcycles. And it's an informal workplace where men dominate as well. If you look through, you see me somewhere there. Um, to close up on the background, um, some potential barriers which we perceived, which may be subjective, for the gender gap ranges from limited access to care-seeking behavior and to cultural factors. Yet globally, including Nigeria, efforts and strategies for TB control are continually targeted towards the perceived vulnerable women and children. The objective of this particular strategies which we carried out was to, uh, this presentation is to describe the process currently being undertaken to improve access to TB diagnosis and treatment among men in Lagos and as well to increase suspicion for TB amongst men in informal workplaces. Going by Jeremiah's presentation, the fourth bullet in his recommendation was for us to focus on where the men are, where they are, and we should look at informal workplaces. And then also to afford us an opportunity to generate a pool of TB mobilizers. 
We did a comparative data analysis of age, sex, disaggregated uh, TB notification between 2015 and 2016 because we needed a baseline information. And then we used a, mul we used a multifaceted approach of which we did some retrospective record review of the TB case notification in the previous five years in Lagos, and then a mapping of the male-dominated industries, informal workplaces, and some congregate settings. We also did some purposive sampling of industrial sites for engagement, and then we applied our own strategy called HIDA, the Engagement Intent Driven Advocacy, of which we'll shed more light on that. And then also we did some situation analysis on the available health services and the utilization within these facilities as far as TB services are concerned in the industries. Um, this is just a consolidation of the strategies which were applied. Some of them varied from the distribution of branded safety vests to the informal workplaces, airing of TB messages at men-dominated congregate settings, engagement of communication experts, the engagement, sensitization, and mobilization, and screening of Okada riders. Uh, we also tried to air some of the radio messages on men-targeted radio stations, where we had higher callers being men, and then the mapping and engagement of large companies, as well as the distribution of IEC materials at local football viewing centers, because that is another setting we know men really, really dominate, especially in Lagos. All the strategies which were applied was actually intended to increase TB screening, increase the awareness of TB among men, generate a pool of mobilizers for TB case finding, and TB advocates as well, and then to improve access for men. So coming to the engagement of the large companies, what we did was to map the available large companies within the Lagos metropolis area, and we came up with 33, and then we did a purposive sampling of the industrial sites. We started out identifying about 10 of these uh, industries to advocate to. So in applying the EDA, what we did was to advocate to the large companies, and then we did a form of sensitization meetings with them, sensitize them about TB, and the need for them to increase the suspicion of TB screening within their healthcare services. And then we did a situation analysis of the available health services within the large companies, its utilization, and then gender disaggregation of staff, which we attempted. Then also the screening was done because there were some large facilities that requested for the screening while others said they didn't need it. Then we did the utilization of um, some of the company executives to link us to other companies as a form of advocacy. At the end of the day, um, we were able to engage some large companies to ensure that there is a six monthly routine screening adherence monitoring. Some of the large companies indicated that yes, they do TB screening or upon entry for new deployments, but then there was no sustained monitoring. And then what we also did was to link the diagnosed TB cases to the NTP surveillance system. For the targeted radio messages, we engaged the communication experts to analyze the most listened station with male-dominated callings. And then TB jingles were developed in multiple dialects and in languages. Then we had the TB messages in four out of the 29 major stations in Lagos, focusing specifically on sports stations and traffic monitoring stations. And then we did an in-depth gender analysis of the radio listeners. In the dissemination of some of the IC materials and the jingles which we had developed, um, we targeted also um, viewing centers because Nigeria is a country that loves football and recently we are not fans of our own Nigerian footballers but we are more fans of the Premier Leagues and the UEFA Championships. So this is a big business in Lagos of which there are lots of viewing centers. So what we targeted was also to key into the interlude sessions in viewing centers to talk about TB and to air some of the messages. So we had some recordings of the aired messages on CDs of which we required the viewing centers to play. We started out identifying two local government areas which is clearly described as district in some countries and mapped out um, 10 viewing centers. There are averagely over 100 centers per local government areas. And in Lagos, there are 20 local government areas. Then we mapped out 21 major gambling sites as well, because gambling has become another big thing in Lagos. And then through this media, we sensitized and aired some of the jingles during the interludes. In the engagement of the Okada riders, in Lagos, there are 377 community wards, 
And in each of these wards, there is a unit of Okada Riders Association. And for each of these association in each of the ward, there's an average of about 160 to 250 Okada Riders, which means that probably in Lagos, the occupation that dominates a lot are informal occupations, just like this Okada riding um, situation. And um, Okada uses an high demand to bypass traffic. So what we did was to engage the association leaders of five particular wards, uh, mostly populated local government areas, and then we sensitized the Okada riders. Uh, TV screening exercises was also requested in each of these association awards. And then they requested also that um, we could brand their safety vest so that they could advocate more about TB and be like ambassadors for us. And then we mobilized, um, there was a mobilization of presumptive TB cases within the community. So if you take a look at this, this is one of the settings where we met the Okada riders. And you can see some of them wearing their vest, which is reflective. Uh, this is just to show you what the Okada is like. And like I said, there is no woman there, not one single woman. Uh, that's the only woman there. Uh, so this is also one of the situations where we were doing some sensitization of which usually we have some of our IC materials posted. And these are some of the Okada riders that wear the vest. Uh, this is where the screening takes place. So we had situations where some Okada riders, after sensitization, they, they, they begged us to stay behind, please, that they had some persons they presumed to be TB, and they brought them down. They went on their bike, brought those persons down, and we had to screen them. And in most of the cases, we had a range of about 10 to 14 presumptives. But I wouldn't want to go into the data now because we're analyzing a full year's um, data. This is the back of what I'm wearing. Uh, that's in local language in Lagos. Pigeon language is one of the, the main ways we communicate. So you, the cough means, are you coughing? And um, another thing we did uh, was to also get a hotline, which is free, which people call for free, and so they can get more information about TB. The immediate results, a pool of TB mobilizers were generated, local TB advocates set powered, increased number of TB referrals from the Okada riders, increased awareness as well, and there was some willingness to participate. And then the linkage to large, of large companies to the NTP surveillance system, and then also affords us opportunities for partnership. Data analysis is ongoing, but preliminary data reveals 96% of callers on selected radio stations are men, and an average of 25% increase in the presumptive cases in the selected local government areas. Some limitations which we experienced was the engagement resistance from the large companies, unavailable data on occupational distribution among men in Lagos, a slow-paced engagement, especially for the Okada riders, difficulty assessing the direct yield of the targeted TB education messages to men, and also the confidentiality of staff and patient data from the large companies. In conclusion, we recommend that we all need to revisit the strategies to cater for the covert group, which is men, and expand our current scope of coverage of targeted male-dominated settings. And as well, while we do this, we should ensure that contact tracing is taken into cognizance for the diagnosed index TB cases derived from these strategies, which is necessary to break barriers. Key take-home questions is TB Evidently more in men, yes. Is there a gender disproportion in disease transmission? Yes. Are men more disadvantaged in accessing, accessing care? Yes. Are we less inclined to recognizing male vulnerability as a gender concern? Yes. If yes to all, we need to advocate more before the men become breathless. Thank you very much. Thank you, brilliant. Uh, thanks for, for showing how to take epidemiological observations and qualitative uh, uh, research into action. And we're looking forward for the final uh, results from this uh, intervention. Um, one or two questions from the audience? Message was very clear. The men are in support, and you <laughs> yes. All answered affirmatively. Okay, thank delivered. you very much. Okay. So we move on. Oh, have you one? Do we have one question? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Just, just a very quick question. Uh, um, I, I, I would like to hear uh, uh, what, what, what's the most biggest uh, challenge to uh, mobilize the Okada rider for the screening? 
Um, time. Time is money. Because the Okada riders, the Okada riding is their business, is their daily source of income. So getting them together was one of our biggest challenges. Meeting the executive leaders of the association was not a challenge, but the executive leaders pulling the Okada riders together was one of the major challenges. But I think over time, as we got them to become TB mobilizers and advocates, they began to understand their role in it. And they actually communicate with other words within Lagos State. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So our final speaker today is Colleen Daniels from um, Stop TV Partnership. So um, I'm going to, uh, we've heard some wonderful examples of in-country um, uh, results from studies and from, from some programs. So what I'm going to do now is take it back out into a, a broader uh, picture, into the larger context of what we're, we're talking about here in terms of human rights and gender. And then I'll finish with an, um, a tool that can actually help you to get the results that we're talking about. Okay, so the Stop TV Partnership, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, though I'm sure all of you have heard of my boss, Luchika, um, over the last few days, so you probably know all about us, but really we're an organization of over uh, 1,300 partners in 100 um, countries around the world, and we all have the, the same mission to serve every person who is vulnerable to TB and ensure that high quality treatment is available to all who need it. So what are we doing with regards to gender and stop TB? Well, we've developed a, uh, a TB HIV, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the wrong presentation. This is the old one, not the uh, new one. Sorry. <laughs> I would do a little dance, but you know, there's no music, there's like, uh, it's kind of late afternoon, we're all a bit tired, probably need a drink. I don't have that either, sorry. Yeah, okay. And we're cooking with gas. Okay, so human rights. The human rights equality-driven gender-based approach to TB, um, which is grounded in international, regional, and domestic law, is really our strategy moving into the new global plan, the paradigm shift. These laws recognize that all human beings have equal human rights, regardless of their nationality, ethnic origin, sex, race, religion, or any other status, and are built around core human rights principles. So human rights in TB um, has not really received as much attention in terms of our global strategies um, to end TB as, as they need to. And however, they're no less important. Um, we have gotten to a stage where we have more TB than we ever thought. We have more deaths than we ever thought. We have more missed cases than we ever thought. And if we don't start changing the way that we address TB, we're no, it's just going to get worse every year. And that bleak report from WHO will get bleaker. So unless we actually start looking at human rights, at community engagement, at gender issues, we will not do anything to change TB. So some of the guiding principles when you're looking at a rights-based approach are uh, universality. Um, that means you know, just human rights are for everyone regardless. Um, indivisibility and interdependence. Um, so it recognizes that if a right such as the right to health is violated, it necessarily affects people's ability to exercise other rights. Um, equality and non-discrimination, accountability, and participation. People have the right to participate directly or through capable representatives in decisions that impact their lives. We have to start engaging communities in our TB response. So what did we do? At Stop TB, we decided to, we worked with the Global Fund and other partners, technical partners, to uh, define what our key and vulnerable populations are. And we use um, three components. So the first one is people who have increased exposure to TB due to where they work or live. So for example, minors, 
uh, prison workers, healthcare workers, Okada drivers, um, and, and others, uh, people who have limited access to quality TB services, and people who are at increased risk of TB because of biological or behavioral factors. So for example, immunocompromised people, people living with HIV, people who have diabetes, and so on. So from that, we looked at those definitions, and then we said, at a global level, what are some of the key and vulnerable populations? And we had the first ever meeting of key populations in November last year um, in Bangkok, Thailand. And from there, we defined some key populations, and we developed technical briefs around these. So we did it uh, for minors, children under five years old, mobile populations, which include migrants, um, internally displaced peoples and in, um, uh, refugees, people who use drugs, prisoners, rural populations, and urban slum dwellers. And we have two more coming out on healthcare workers and people living with HIV. So these are to give people examples of what a key and vulnerable population can look like. But what we're doing now is developing a framework and a tool so that countries can estimate the size and burden of TB in their key populations, because it is country specific. This is not something that at a Geneva level, I can say, say to you, these are your, these are your um, key and vulnerable populations. You have to be able to determine that yourself. And sometimes it could be something where you might not think of it. So you know, when I was doing a TB program review in Philippines, we realized that actually fishermen are a key population. And I talked to several of them, and one man over 20 years had TB six times because they go out on the boats, after months they come back, they have the cough, they have TB, they start treatment, but then they go back out, they don't finish the treatment, and so on and so forth. And his became uh, MDR-TB, and at the end he couldn't work anymore. So it really does depend on your country context. And these are just an example of what some of the guides look like. We have uh, recommendations for various groups across uh, the board. So we're also developing a legal environment assessment tool to look at what the policies and le legislation is in a country to be able to, de to determine what are the um, barriers, uh, human rights barriers, what are, some, what are some of the human rights barriers people face on a daily basis that we don't even think might be a barrier uh, or might be a human rights abuse. We're working with the judiciary, so lawyers and um, judges in different countries to bring them together with people with the disease, um, implementers and donors so that we can raise awareness so that when cases come to their courts, they recognize them. And it also then gives us an opportunity to look at litigation um, from uh, occupational hazards. So if you're a healthcare worker, or um, and you know we know that healthcare workers have six times greater risk of, of getting TB than the general population. And we're developing a TB case compendium because we don't have that, it's, it's non-existent. So this is looking at all the cases of TB around the world so we can show precedent. So when it comes to gender, what we did is we worked with UNAIDS to develop a TBHIV gender assessment tool. Um, it's now been conducted in Lesotho, Niger, and Namibia. And um, I wanted to just talk about this a little bit because um, you know what we're really looking at is what are the specific tailored interventions that we need to have for men, women, girls, and boys? Right, to address gender issues so that we can create gender sensitive and gender transformative interventions. Um, so uh, there, it's not that men have more TB or more barriers, or more, it's just that they need a different approach. They need different interventions. They need something tailored to their specific barriers. The same with women. So for example, in Niger, we were asked to do uh, an assessment there because we saw notifications were 70% men, 30% women. And we would normally expect a 60% men, 40% women, something like that. But when it's 70-30, it's like, kind of like a red flag goes up. And what we saw were that um, more men were able to go because they had that freedom of movement, whereas women didn't. Um, women ha were relied on a male, for example, to pay for them to go to a service. They had to wait for someone to take them to a service. Um, when they got to the service, a lot of them actually didn't get diagnosed because it was culturally inappropriate to provide a sputum sample. So, you know, how do you how do you um, hawk a loogie if you're a lady? Right? It, it's uh, it's not appropriate in well any civil society, but. 
that's what we have to do. And so it's about raising awareness about these issues. With men, we notice that um, a lot of them might get to a health center, but if they have to sit there for three hours, that means it's, it's back to what you talked about earlier. It's time is money. They're not going to do that. They might come to a, a, a health facility, but they don't stay to be diagnosed. Or um, they, take, they get medicines, but it means that they can pay for this amount, even if it's supposed to be free, and it isn't in some places because there are other costs, then they don't do that. Right? So then they don't complete um, treatment. So there are specific tailored interventions that we need depending on the barriers. And we are working with the Global Fund, for example, to develop uh, operational KPIs on gender. So with this gender assessment tool, the purpose of it really is to provide data, analysis, and interventions to make the national TB response gender sensitive. Um, to provide, and you can do the, you can either do it as TB and HIV together, or you can do them as separate ones. But we prefer, if you if you have high burdens of TB HIV co-infection, to actually do them together. We also hope that the results of these will feed into national strategic plans, which will then feed into global fund concept notes and other funding requests. And you know, Global Fund has now announced there are three windows open um, at the start of next year. And so here's an opportunity to get a gender assessment included in your grant. So the new Global Fund strategy has a, a brand new fourth component, which is all about human rights and gender. So let's take advantage of that. Um, we've noticed that you know when it comes to human rights in concept notes and in and, and then in, in grants we hardly have any TB zero point I think it was zero point two percent of the funding actually goes to human rights and gender in tuberculosis and this has got to change so with the actual tool it gives you it lays out the stages of what you need to do so how to prepare for it how to understand your epidemics in your context um, knowing what your res current responses are, and then analyzing and using the findings of the assessment to provide um, tailored interventions. Because there is nothing worse than having a report that goes nowhere. There's nothing worse than collecting data that doesn't lead to programmatic change. Don't collect it if that's what's going to happen, right? So collect it with the idea that we're going to have programmatic change. And knowing that, include it in your um, funding requests. So if we're going to have a gender assessment, then have to have money set aside to be able to actually implement those recommendations. So this is just an example of one of the steps um, when we're looking at uh, HIV and TB, and so we actually go through questions. We have checklists, and it, we've tried to make it as simple as possible for people to do this. Um, and then this is, I just pulled out you know, a few things about um, some of the findings out of one of them. So when it comes to discrimination cases, rarely if ever brought to court, um, but we, we have you know, know your rights um, can help women and men in key populations claim their legal rights. So if we don't even know what the laws are in our country or around workers in congregate settings, for example, um, then how do they know where to, to be able to go to, to help themselves? And again, we, this is sort of how we've uh, used a matrix to be able to um, then come up with some interventions at the end of it. Um, and of course, that will depend on where you, you do the um, assessment and who you're talking to and what information you're looking at. But um, thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you, Colleen, so much for uh, this very nice and clear overview of how, how this work can, is already feeding into the work of the partnership. Uh, the implementation of the global plan, how it should influence na na national strategic plan development and concepts you know, to the, the global fund, uh, making it you know, very clear what the practical steps moving ahead are. Um, at this point, we have a bit more than 10 minutes for general discussion, but maybe first questions to Colleen, and then we'll open up questions and comments uh, to the whole panel of presenters. Who wants to start? Catherine. Hi, Colleen. Thanks so much for that presentation. Um, I think it's really optimistic that this gender assessment tool allows for the inclusion of both men and women, because often they're very much targeted for women. And I think this one provides a, a broader framework, which I think is great. Um, what I did notice was when you were talking through the key population, key affected populations mm -hmm. and vulnerable populations, when you talk about persons with limited access to care, 
It mentions women in settings with gender disparity. I was just curious if you could maybe um, speak about how do we move forward with the evidence that we have that often men are the ones on, on the losing side of that gender disparity in terms of burden of disease and access to care. How do we move forward with getting men recognized as a vulnerable mm -hmm. population? Well, I think then, you know, where we've gone, not wrong, but what's happened in our response, in our gender response, is that it's assumed that gender is women. Gender is women and, girl, and young girls. Um, and I think partly it, it comes out of our HIV response because at the moment, um, young girls 15 to 24 are our target because they're the highest risk group for HIV. And so I think some of that, that uh, dialogue around gender is actually coming from there. And you know, because we haven't really talked about gender in TB, we have an opportunity to change that. We have an opportunity to change that definition. And um, I just put a snapshot up there of the definitions, but if you look at the actual detailed definitions, you'll see that it says men um, as well. But here is our opportunity to talk about men and women, boys and girls, and go back to what gender um, was originally about which is trying to have targeted approaches for each gender so that it supports their right to access um, health services. And um, you know, because we've start, we're, we're like 30 years behind the game in TB in terms of this, we have that opportunity now to change that dialogue um, and to not get swept up into you know, what other diseases are doing. Um, and really, if we look at our epidemiology, as, as the two of you showed earlier, well, all three of you, um, then we need to be, re be able to respond to that and not what other people tell us to. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, very good in presentation. I just have a question. Um, can you um, expand a little bit on how the methodology of the assessment is done, the timeline, how is it done, organized nationwide? And yep. The process. Thank okay. you. Sure. So what we did was we set up a model um, where we have a cadre of international consultants from all over the world speaking different languages who have been trained to actually conduct this um, uh, this tool. And then we paired that one international person with two local consultants, one on HIV and one on TB in the country. Um, what we've had so far is a stakeholder group that's uh, established in the country, so we, we have ownership. Um, and UNAIDS has been great in helping us to be able to do that, particularly in Lesotho and Namibia. Um, and then from there, they're able to then go out and they collect the data, so they do desk reviews, looking at all the data that's out there in current national responses, where they can find sex and age disaggregated data, they use that, but that has been the biggest finding in all three of our uh, assessments so far and in several other uh, anecdotal um, responses we've had from countries is that finding sex and age disaggregated data in tuberculosis is impossible. Um, we have big global numbers, and when I go to the clinics, all that data is sitting in people's files, but it's not aggregated at a subnational or a national level. And so if we're not doing that, then we're not going to be able to respond adequately to, for example, the Okada writers, right? Um, and so once they do that, then they also have key stakeholder interviews um, with a lot of different people, um, affected com uh, communities um, and uh, implementers and donors and so on in the country, policymakers and, and so on. And all that data is then brought together and it's analyzed and there's a validation workshop at the end where all those stakeholders come together again and they look at the data and they um, come up with the recommendations. And we're hopeful that those recommendations are then funded. Right, so Lesotho is a great example. They were so, did the, the <coughs> assessment so rapidly and so well, and they came out with such specific recommendations that almost all of them were then put into their Global Fund grant. I'm waiting for someone to step up, please. Hi, Peter McPherson from Liverpool. I had a question for Catherine, actually. Um, and it's should, we have the, should we have yeah. all the speakers up? That would be great, right. yeah. 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 So if you don't mind standing. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just wondering if we have, if we do have kind of analogies from other diseases with a long symptomatic period that are often stigmatized, have we got data on prevalence or, or an access to care disaggregated by gender, I think perhaps leprosy or, or leishmaniasis, something like that. Are there any analogies that we might draw upon in, in, in TB? I think that's a great question. Um, 
And I don't know. Yeah, I'm not um, sure there's anyone here. I mean, I think really HIV cool. is probably the, yeah, yeah. the one that we can draw the greatest analogies with. Um, but that would actually be really interesting to look into those diseases as well. I don't know. Maybe just um, a, a reflection and, and a sort of lead-on question. I, I think from, if you look at high-income countries with those good health, healthcare utilization data, the usual pattern is that women have ho more morbidity re recorded often because there is high utilization of services and men have higher mortality, which may be an indication of delaying uh, health seeking. This is sort of a general pattern. And I was actually uh, having a question of how much data do we have from, from TB high burden countries on general uh, healthcare u utilization patterns that should feed into to the mapping of, of the barriers. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Gerardo from Nigeria. I think my is a comment, uh, but really very nice presentation from the three ladies supporting men. <laughs> I think throughout this conference, there is another thing that is coming out as an opportunity uh, in looking at issues to do with men. Are we dealing with access or are we dealing with alternative access? Are they going to where we are not there? So I think it is very appropriate for us now to integrate patient pathways into our discussion. Most likely they are assessing services at the lowest pattern medicine vendors, private sectors, they are in a hurry. So maybe they are just doing self-medication. So I think we should start thinking about patient pathways as we move forward to see whether we are actually dealing with true access or access to alternative services that are not integrated into the routine services that we are dealing with. Number two, I think we should be very careful with our definitions of vulnerability. What does vulnerability, vulnerable group mean? I think we need to really, if we say men are vulnerable, are we talking about real vulnerability or are we talking about limitation to access? So I think we need to be very careful with the concept of some of these definitions. Thank you. Yeah, I just come back to your, um, you know, I, I mean, for me, from my perspective, uh, what we need to do is stop creating um, situations where patients have to bend to the program and what the program needs are, and we should actually be having programs respond to what the person's needs are. And so it's not about alternative therapy uh, 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 pathways, but it's about changing the way that we operate, right? Exactly, to the needs, for example, the Okada writers, they're not gonna come into a health facility, but we need to go out to them. So why don't we put our health facilities where people actually are? Why don't we have outreach in, in the, um, uh, football viewing centers and so on. That should be part of our programs. It should not be an add-on by a donor. This should be part of our everyday work, and that's not that's what's not happening. Hi again. My name is Han, and I'm from the United States, but currently working in Nigeria. Also, wanted to thank all the presenters for your excellent presentations. Um, my question is actually probably directed to Catherine. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of data evidence do we have regarding gender differences for MDR-TB um, as well as TB HIV co-infected patients with regards to burden and care pathways? Right, so starting with MDR, we basically don't have much data. Um, so when we were doing our review on TB prevalence, we tried to also look at MDR prevalence and when you look at the way that data are reported, they're not disaggregated by, by gender, and so we weren't able to assess differences there. Sorry, remind me your second question? Uh, it's with regards to TB, HIV, co-infected patients. Yeah, also unclear what the differences are. So we certainly know that in many places, HIV prevalence is higher among women. It's not clear, though, if either gender is at greater risk of co-infection than the other, or the TB HIV outcomes. Also a bit unclear whether one gender has worse outcomes. Certainly we see among men less access to HIV treatment, less access to TB treatment, and so therefore likely worse outcomes, but evidence on that is sparse as well. Um, just a comment sort of in response to Peter's question. I think probably the model diseases to look at are actually outside infectious disease, and coming from a high income country, I would look at the discussions that are happening now around cancer, particularly colon cancer um, and skin cancer. I know in Australia there's a big gender lack in terms of access to care and, and mortality in men just waiting forever. Um, and also in male mental health and male suicide, there's a lot of discussion now about 
how do we facilitate men's access to care and how do we get men talking about these issues? So I think there are models out there, but they're not in the global health space necessarily. Yes, I'm Merete Takstrav from LHL International in Norway. Thank you for nice uh, thought-evoking presentations. I'm wondering if you have any um, data regarding the general prevalence among the general male population as opposed to high-risk environments that we are aware of, like mining sector, prison sector, uniformed forces, and things like that. Uh, I think that uh, there are quite a lot of targeted interventions in those sectors specifically. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I had. So, I mean, for us, uh, that's one of the things that we're advocating for, is for us to actually collect data on our key and vulnerable populations. So, for example, we don't really know um, about. Uh, we can we know a little bit about minors and we know a little bit about prisoners and but we don't really know for example mobile populations and we don't really know about urban slum dwellers or healthcare workers um, in and we don't have that by sex and age disaggregated data so that's something that we're we're definitely advocating for and where possible in a country we really urge you to do that um, maybe to add to this um, part of the strategies were also bringing on board, which was starting with a couple of states, is to focus on urban slums in the mining sector, silica production and all that. And probably maybe the findings we we'll get from that will also share and it will give us an insight of the prevalence in men. So uh, let's have a final question. Our time is actually up, but one more question, please. Hello, I'm Leslie Hill from uh, Scotland and I've done some work on men's psychological distress um, when infected with TB and, and their households. And I just felt really warm today by the focus on men and men's needs, which I agree is completely missed, and specifically on Jeremiah's work, because I think it's, we need to just be a bit careful. We don't get too caught up with all the practical things, which are really important about access, but issues around masculinity and distress and the narrow path that some men have to walk because of their social constraints, which cause them distress and um, psychological problems, as, as well as all the rest of the things that go around healthcare. So particularly, I was thinking around the provision for the family and being involved in that. So I'm just uh, thank you for bringing that. And we need to hold on to the, the masculinities and hear it from the men, I think, is the, the message there, to really listen to what they think about those things and what changes they think could be made. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, th I think that sort, sort of feeds into um, the earlier question about what is vulnerability. And I, I, I think it just shows the complexity of looking at all these. But um, certainly, w what we would want to strive for is to not leave anyone vulnerable, whether psychologically, physically. And men are powerful. And part of that power is also what makes them vulnerable. So, so we need to sort of understand that complexity. So um, we want to understand when, when they are powerful, but when they become vulnerable, and then attend to them in that kind of context so that we pull them out and we can promote them, but they can also be a, a, a pathway to promoting broader community health. Okay, thank you. It's time to wrap up. I'd like to, to thank all the presenters, and I'll, I'll, we'll just wrap up with some not conclusions at all, but just a reflection. And, and I'm going to put a provocative question, but not to the panel, for all of you to go home and ponder upon. Um, often when we identify vulnerable groups, the response includes uh, a number of really practical things that are usually about improving access and reaching out to the vulnerable groups with the proven interventions that we have. And much less often we talk about addressing the underlying vulnerability itself. So I'm a big advocate about thinking also upstreams, you know, the underlying things that are there. So maybe it's not correct to say we want to reduce masculinity in society, <laughs> but maybe we need to think about the national strategic plan to address, you know, macho hero culture among men where all weakness and vulnerability must be hidden. And as a man, you need to toughen up pull yourself together and get on with your duties, which is the mentality often ingrained in society. 
So think about that. Now, in this conference, everybody needs to declare a conflict of interest. So I should say, I'm from Sweden, okay. Uh, <laughs> I will leave you at that with that thought. Chris, uh, Liz. Yeah. Very, um, a, a very um, wonderful um, symposium. So th thanks to everyone for coming, to the speakers for such um, thought-provoking and, and you know, just a different way of looking at such an obviously big problem. And um, um, again, I, I mean, I, I was just pondering as well that, um, uh, you know, I think men's reaction to the segment of the male gender that is in 20% uh, of, uh, let's say, the loser category. So, like, you know, if you, if you can um, use your masculinity and stratify it into quintiles, you know, there's going to be a 20% down at the bottom of men who are just very unsuccessful. And um, uh, wherever I've practiced medicine, the way, when you see those guys, you know, they suffer more than anyone else in the population. There's nothing given for them. They, they're the ones coming in, you know, still working with like arthritis, HIV, you know, they're like threadbare, their clothes are ruined, and they've got two kids, and they'll tell you, until I die, no one's going to help me. No one's going to look after the kids or take them off me. So, so again, I, and I think there's a mindset from men, you know, most of the men in health don't come from that bottom 20%. So again, I, I think there's some issues that men have to ask themselves about why are they being so harsh on their fellow men. And, uh, and women seem to have a more sympathetic role to that, as I think, again, has come out very strongly from here. So, so it's actually quite hard for men, I think, to advocate for men for many reasons, but including, I suspect, a sort of Donald Trump mentality, <laughs> <laughs> if I may dare to say it. Um, the, the, you know, you know, and and yet, yet that's you know, as we've heard, health and human rights are universal. So, thank you very much. Thank you.